I don't know if you noticed it. Um, if you if you're not musical uh, or you don't know a whole lot about music, uh, you may not appreciate the difficulty it is in in leading a song that's with six eight timing. Um, and that's the song we just sang is six eight timing. And there's really only two ways you can do it. And if you follow if you follow uh, every beat, you know <laughs> you can, your arms can be really tired after the first verse. It was just funny to watch Darren do that, actually. So um, it's, uh, it's always a bit of a challenge. Some guys, they just give up, and they just drop their arms, and they just sing. <laughs> and so you, you, you went back and forth a couple times, no problem. But um, it's easy to laugh at a guy when you're not the one standing here doing it. That's, uh, <clears throat> we have, as you know, been going through our, our study together of the timeline of the Bible. And I was just thinking I wanted to share this with you. It, in the years after I graduated high school, I started going through my own journey of college or university, and um, the church that uh, that I went to, so the church that April was born and raised in, uh, the pastor at the time was my pastor in those years, uh, and he was quite a good teacher of the Bible, and um, he, he wasn't a, a really great preacher, but from a teaching point of view, just a very excellent teacher, and so it just so happened in those years that... Uh, at that time, he was teaching through the book of Revelation. It's always a fascinating book. But the, the study of his teaching through the book of Revelation was 10 years. And so every Sunday, I believe evening, every Sunday night, we, we went through Revelation. And it was like a decade of Revelation. I mean, you'd think if anybody knew it, we'd know it, you know, by that time. But I, I remember that uh, because when you're studying in the Bible in that way, going through a book that way at such depth, it really just runs you from Genesis to Revelation, back and forth and back and forth through the whole Bible. So really what you had was you had just this expo exposition of Scripture all the way through the Bible, back and forth for years and years and years. And I remember those years very plainly. That developed in me a hunger for the Bible. Um, whether or not I remembered everything about Revelation or not was not the point. The point is that it just created in me this great hunger for the Word of God. When um, I sat underneath of a man who was able to to thread it all together to help me to understand it. And it just created a hunger in me that um, I'm so grateful for. And one of the things that I, I really pray that our Sunday nights are doing is, you know, in its own way, creating that for our church family. As we go through this timeline, we, we really are going to be running through the entire Bible. And we'll go back and forth, and we'll look at a lot of cross-referencing and just, you know, try to understand it in its context and in its historical context. But my prayer for you in this as a church family is that it would just spark within you or maybe just renew, just rekindle within you a love for the Bible and a desire to get into it and just study it a little bit at, at, a, at a deeper level in your own life. It's one thing to sit under teaching and to enjoy it and learn from it. It's something entirely different to carve out the time in your own personal life where you open the Bible and you let the Spirit of God teach you. And it's, so the, both of those are wonderful things, but neither one of those replace each other. And I just want to encourage you to do that. I, I know we're in a time-poor life, but that's not an excuse that we don't have a little bit of time uh, to dig into the Scripture ourselves. And so I just want to challenge you with that. I really enjoy the study side of this, but oftentimes in teaching, you enjoy the study side of it more than the people enjoy the teaching of it. And so I just I want to encourage you to... Um, to just let the Lord create in you or just rekindle in you a, a hunger for the Bible. So here we are uh, in mid-October. And if you recall, in the early part of January, we started. And yet we just now are uh, rounding the middle chapters of the book of Exodus, which, in case you're not aware, is only the second book of the Bible. So at, the, at this rate, we'll be, we'll be old by the time it's all done. But I, it'll actually move a little bit more quickly. I've I've actually said that to you a few times, and I think I've lied about it, but I do think it's going to move a little bit more quickly, because now we, what we have is we have, um, we have long books that span short time, and so uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to cover more as far as uh, pages of Scripture in, in a setting, um, and I think that will be helpful, because uh, I've, I've just really prayed about the, the things I'm supposed to give to you, and then the things that I, I leave, leave off to the side, because there's just more than you can possibly give it in this type of a lesson. Nevertheless, we find ourselves in the, the period of what we know to be the Exodus. Um, and I think I mentioned to you last Sunday night, this, the study of this particular topic has been of just such of great interest to me because over the last few weeks as I've dug into this, the Lord has really uh, corrected some things in my own thinking about 
this time in the history of Israel and in your Bible. If you were raised in church, which a lot of us were, then throughout Sunday school, you heard stories about the Exodus, right? We heard stories about the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, you, you, know, you were raised with the stories of God dropping bread down from heaven in the wilderness. We'll look at that. Um, so you were raised with a lot of those stories, but uh, unless you've physically been you know, geographically in that location, all you can do when you read that story or hear it taught is you fabricate in your mind what that looked like. And we all have a different visual picture of that. And none of it is right. I'm not saying it's wrong because you're just fabricating something in your mind that you've never seen. We all do that naturally. But it's not accurate. And so as I've been studying through this and, and really digging in, and the, the blessing is to be able to go back and with our digital world now, you can actually go back and look at um, ancient documents that reveal some things that we can't see in sort of modern day documents. It's just been a fascinating study. And the Lord has really shown me a lot about this. And it's just been encouraging and, and, a, and a blessing to me. So I want to try to transmit that uh, into you a little bit. Uh, so what I want to do here tonight, um, man, I need a bigger pulpit. What I need to do to your, here tonight is just to give um, a, a little bit of an overview of our last week and ask if you brought your notes with you. I hope you brought them. I didn't print out new notes. It's the same study. Um, so grab those from last week, if you will, and then find your Bible um, to, uh, we might start in numbers, but let me just tell you where I want you to go in that. Uh, if you recall, I gave you this sheet. Oh, does anybody need, we've got a few copies here. If you need a copy, just raise up your hand, um, and then we'll try. We won't, I think we've only got three or four or five or something copies, so... Um, if they're husbands and wives, maybe you can share if, if we don't have enough to go around. And then these are the maps. I, I want to make sure that every, at least every sort of couple or whatever has a copy of this map um, so that you can have a look at this. And I do think that this will help you to understand. Now, now as you're getting all this, let me just sort of reiterate something for you. The goal behind this is for you to understand a couple things. Number one, um, every word about this event is exactly right. Okay, everything God said about the circumstances behind, behind Israel leaving Egypt is, is absolutely right. Are you with me? Whether or not the world believes it is irrelevant to our study. Okay? So I'm not worried about what people outside the, the, the doors of our church think about this. I'm, I'm preaching to believers in Christ. We're, I'm teaching you as believers in Christ. I'm taking it at face value that you believe the Bible to be true. So I'm going to teach it as if it's true because it's true. Okay? So every, everything that God said in this is exactly right. And uh, it, it's actually, I didn't include it in your notes, but there is, um, you can trace the root of the Exodus uh, almost by the number of days. And uh, you, can, you can figure out almost the number of days from the time they left Goshen until the time they got where they were supposed to go. So you can trace all of this through. And then I wanted you to see the, the map here so I could show you the, the route that they took. So let me just kind of walk you through just a basic uh, timeline from where we started last week. I'm not going to dig into the depths of it, but just an overview. I've called this, as you know, the wandering rebels, because this is really what happened with Israel. Israel was a rebellious people, and God was trying to get their attention. So uh, we know, of course, they had the first Passover. And uh, we know then there was the final awful judgment on the, the land of Egypt where there was the death of the firstborn. And then God delivered them and they went out with a high hand. So we know that that took place. And now we have this new fledgling nation of which there are, there are elders and rulers over the nation now. And they're on the move out of the land of Goshen. If you're looking on your map, the top left of it, you see it says Goshen up there. That's where they were in that part of Egypt. Uh, so they start moving out after that first Passover. And they move south. Uh, and you'll see that there's these two horns of the Red Sea that prong up. They're, they're two different gulfs today by the way that we, we name bodies of water. But in, in this day, and God's reference in the scripture is this is the Red Sea. It's the large body of water beneath it and the two prongs that come up. It's all part of the Red Sea. So they move uh, on the inside of that prong southward out of Goshen and down uh, toward the V uh, at the bottom there. And that whole area, if you're familiar with modern geography... That whole area that you see in the center of your map is referred to today as the, the Sinaitic Peninsula, right? Uh, but that's not the biblical Sinai. So even though it's labeled that way in your map, it's not the biblical Sinai. So they're coming down this direction, and uh, they're on their way down to where they're going to be crossing the Red Sea, okay? So they, they move down now, 
they're not aware that Pharaoh is watching this. Pharaoh's grieving for the loss of his firstborn son as the rest of the nation of Egypt is grieving. And yet um, the, the intelligence community of this most powerful nation uh, reports to Pharaoh in the midst of the grief that Israel is not going uh, due east as if they were going to go back to the land from which they hailed, the, the land of Canaan. They've actually gone south. And so Pharaoh knows two things about that. The first thing he knows is uh, they deceived me. They're actually trying to get away. And I got them because he knew his own land and he knew if they go south, there's nowhere to go. It's just nothing but water. And so no matter how far south they go, they're going to hit the bottom of that. And you see in your map, and if you were to look on another map where you see the whole Red Sea, I mean, that's just a body of water. So Pharaoh knows now that they were, that they were trapped, and he's told that the people have fled. And so now Pharaoh decides, okay, here's what I'm going to do. We may be grieving the destruction of our nation and the loss of the firstborn, but we are not going to lose our slave labor. And so I'm going to, I'm going to go after it and we're going to bring them back. So that's what Pharaoh's design is. So the nation now... Um, moves south, and they end up stopping first. If you're looking on your map, you see on the big map there, they stop at the first uh, place, which is called Sukkoth. Remember, we talked about this, um, and it's got a different name today called Sarabit el Kadim, but it's the site of these ancient Egyptian and turquoise mines. There was another one just due east of that, inside what we know to be the Sinai Peninsula today, but this is Egyptian territory. These were Egyptian uh, copper and turquoise mines, and so the, the nation stops there on the first day, collects the slaves that were working in the mines, and then continues down uh, south as they're leaving the land of Egypt. So they're on their second day. The next day, they get down to Etham. Are you looking on your map? So they, get, they go to the bottom, and they sort of go up, and they curve up just very, very briefly, probably a couple of hours, as it were, a walk there, and they get to this place called Etham. And the word Etham literally means shut in. That's the name of it. And the reason that's the case is because that, that particular small area sits directly south of a mountain range, right on a mountain range, and there's nowhere to go. So they, are you, are you looking in the map? They went down and came up, and when they went to Etham, there was no further they could go north because they hit the mountains. So now the only way they can go is they can go east uh, into the Red Sea, or they can go back south where they came from. So Pharaoh hears that they have hit Etham, and he, he knows they're shut in. I've got them. They're stuck. Nowhere to go. So Pharaoh now pursues all the way down. He follows the same red line, as it were, from Goshen. Pharaoh pursues them down the side of the Red Sea, and he's going to catch them and, uh, at the bottom down there. That's where he knows that they're at. And so uh, if you're looking in your notes, and I've given you some notes from last week. I, I mentioned things if you wrote those down. God said to Moses, you tell the people to turn south from Etham. So if you notice on your map, they go straight down just a little, little bit. You're just talking about a few hours of a walk. They go straight south, and they get to this place that we, we know to be Migdol. And uh, it's, it's, uh, they encamp before an area called Pihahirath, uh, and it's Migdol by the Red Sea. And uh, so that's where they, they go. They, they go south, and they camp right there. And this is what... Um, this is what God is showing you a couple things. Okay, This is number one. This is the place, the location over which they crossed the Red Sea. As you see on your map, it's that area. Uh, but secondly, um, uh, it shows you then that this is still considered Egypt. This Sinai Peninsula that we're looking at is still in ancient Egypt. It, it, this was part of Egyptian territory. So they had not yet left Egypt. They'd left Goshen, but they had not left e yet left Egypt. You understand? So God is now going to just show you this is the location of their crossing. So you can see that on your map. Um, if you recall from your notes from last week, I, I've actually given you a little map in here that, that shows you where the, the territory of ancient Egypt was, and it shows you that the current day Sinai Peninsula in, with that big red star, if you recall. Actually, you've got that there, yeah. That, that is the Sinai Peninsula. That was actually considered to be um, Egyptian territory. So this was still Egypt, all right? So they have not yet left Egypt. Now God brings them to the, the brink of the Red Sea. So what's the miracle? Well, here's the story of the miracle. They get to the Red Sea, and uh, God has a pillar of cloud drop down out of the sky. Now, this isn't like a puffy little cumulus cloud. You're talking about this enormous supernatural pillar of cloud that goes from right here to way up into the sky. And you can tell this is not an ordinary cloud. And God brings this thing as a symbol of his guidance. He's using that literally to guide the nation from place to place. Uh, but he also uses that as a barrier of protection. So as they get to this place of the Red Sea, if you're looking on the, the original map, you see where they're at Migdal there, and they're camped there now, 
and they lift up their eyes and they look behind them. Now they're looking south down on your map. They're looking south and they see the, the sun glittering off the swords and the spears of the advancing Egyptian army and they cry out in terror. We've escaped from the land of Egypt. We're going to die here. You know, we're going to die. Why did you bring us out? So Moses goes to God and says, what in the world are we going to do? And God says, what are you crying about? You remember? He says, what are you crying to me for? He said, you tell the people to go forward. And so Moses says, all right, here's what you're going to do. He tells the people, uh, you stand still and you're going to see God save you. And by the way, he points back, if you will, to the Egyptian army. He says, you see all them? You're not ever going to see him again. Now, the people have no idea how this is going to take place, but God knows. So he tells Moses, uh, what do you have? What's Moses have in his hand? He's got the rod, right? So this big, long rod, the symbol of his authority, if you will. And God said to Moses, you hold that thing up over the, over the Red Sea. Moses stands by the brink of the water, just lifts up that rod. And God starts sending a wind through. And it's a very, no doubt, uh, it's a, like a wind shear. I mean, that's what it is. And it starts to blow. And God blows the waters apart all, the, all the night. And so by the time you get into the early morning hours, uh, God has split the sea. Okay, so let's be clear what we're talking about. Um, we, we know from, from uh, radar today that that part of the Red Sea is at least 250 meters deep, which is quite shallow compared to a seabed, but that area is 250 meters deep. That's pretty deep, all right? So God splits the sea. They didn't, wa they didn't wade through in the reeds. They walked through the midst of the, of the sea. God split it. Now, again, to us, that's not a surprise because we've just seen what God did to the nation of Egypt. And what was it? All of it was supernatural. So here's just another supernatural act of God. So uh, in the morning, the Israelites marched through that Red Sea, and it was on dry ground. I, you visualize this. The waters are walls on their left and the right, and they're walking through the, this, this amazing tunnel of water uh, on dry ground. It's no mud. It's just dry ground as they go through. And the whole nation advances through in the early morning hours. Now, Pharaoh sees this happening when he gets up in the morning. He sees the nation has already well and truly crossed over, and he drives his army in after him. He has one thing on his mind. It's the destruction of this nation. They're not going to get away. We either bring them captive back to, the back to the land, or we kill them all. So Pharaoh drives in, and then God takes over, right? And so what happens? Uh, the, the Lord takes the wheels of their chariots off. This would have been a great movie. And uh, Pharaoh says, man, we got to get out of here. God's going to fight for the, for the Israelites. And that's exactly what happens. So uh, Moses holds up the rod again, and God drops the waters. And if you've ever seen a cascade of water, a dam bursting or anything like that, I mean, just imagine what that was like. And the sea crashes back in on itself and kills every one of the army of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So what God said is exactly right. You're not going to see him again anymore. So in the morning light, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You could read it in Exodus. We went through it. Um, they saw nothing but the bodies of Egyptians washing up onto the shore. Okay. So the next chapter in the book of Exodus, which we didn't look at last week, is the song of Miriam um, who, who sings about the deliverance. The horse and rider has he thrown into the sea. It's this great song. Uh, about God's deliverance for the nation of Egypt. Now, you would have thought by, uh, by this time that after they've watched all of the destruction of the nation of the ten plagues, and then here just days into their march out of the land of Egypt, God destroys the army. Wouldn't we think that at this time there is no way they're going to doubt the providence of God? And yet what do we find? I mean immediately they start complaining, Okay. And, of course, we know that it wasn't just them as a nation, but we know the mixed multitude was there. So Pharaoh now marches toward them. God splits the ocean. The, the Israelites go through on dry ground, and um, Pharaoh, Pharaoh drowns, and um, the, the whole army uh, now is destroyed. So if we continue on in the, the notes that we had from last week, just very briefly, they, they get to a place called Rephidim, and uh, you'll see this in your notes as well. And uh, this is uh, now, by the time they get to Rephidim, it's about a month and a half or so after they le uh, they've left Egypt. And um, I didn't put this on your map, but if you were to look on the main map, it's just, just directly below the wilderness of, of Sinai. You'll see that red dot there on your map. Okay, that red dot is where Mount Sinai is, and so Rephidim is just below that. So they've walked around now and come up uh, on the other side toward the mountain of Sinai. And this is Rephidim. So this is where they pitched. Exodus chapter 17 says that they pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. So this is the time when Joshua fights Amalek, right? That great story. 
And uh, so Aaron and her hold up Moses' hands. You remember the story. And uh, then Jethro comes out to see Moses. And Moses um, spends time with his father-in-law. His father-in-law tells him how to delegate. Uh, and then, of course, we know that water comes out of the rock. So let's talk about the typology there for just a minute. Uh, do you know the typology of that story? So the, the rock is a picture of, as Exodus is a, is a picture of things, the rock is a picture of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the rock. Um, how many times was the Lord wounded or smitten for us? Right, the book of Hebrews says he died once for all. One time, one sacrifice forever, right? Okay, so this was all meant to be a picture. So God says to Moses, now you, you go to Sinai and you're going to stand on a rock before me. And then you're going to hit the rock and water is going to come out and it's going to nourish the people. And so Moses obeys and this is exactly what happens, right? So he goes and he smites the rock, hits the rock. Water gushes out enough that uh, we're not talking about a trickle of water, guys. We're talking about enough water that is going to meet the need of uh, two or three million people. This is a significant amount of water coming out of this rock. So this is what happens. And all of this takes place at Rephidim. Now, he gets the instruction to, to hit the rock at Rephidim. He goes up to Sinai and actually does that, and that's where the water comes from. So this is all what takes place in Rephidim. Now, I mentioned to you then last week that when they get to Sinai, Sinai is the place where they spent about a year. They were 11 months and I think five days in, in Mount Sinai, and they were camped at the base of the mountain, and so this takes place there. This is northwest Saudi Arabia T today. If you're looking on a map, that's where this area is. And uh, this is where Moses kept the flock of Jethro when he was younger than this now. And um, this is where he was when he met uh, Zipporah and when he was living there as he fled from, from Pharaoh. So all of this took place there. So at the, at the mountain then, um, he gets to Sinai. This is where Moses is given the law. Okay, we know the Ten Commandments, right? All of this came from Sinai. This is where they were. Uh, this is more, Moses who's 40 days with the Lord and then another 40 later. Uh, up on the mountain, and you, you probably know those story. This is where Moses gets the pattern of the tabernacle, and all of that was laid out for Moses there, and he gives that to the nation. This is where the golden calf takes place, which I think we're going to look at in a little bit more depth at another time. Um, and then Sinai is the place where the, the tabernacle was first constructed. So God said to Moses, um, I want you to build this tabernacle. Okay, now listen, what's a tabernacle? What does the word mean? It's a tent. That's what the word means. A tabernacle is a tent. So what was the purpose of the tent? Yeah. Effectively, God said, this is, the, this is like the temporary temple, okay? This is going to be the house that you worship me in, um, but it's a house on the move, right? It's like a caravan today. It's just a house on wheels. Um, and so this is a temporary thing, and when you're parked in a place, you, you pitch the tent, and then when we got to move somewhere else, then you, you pack it all up and carry it and move to the next place. So God instituted this at Mount Sinai. This is the place where uh, Nadab and, uh, and Abihu die. Uh, you remember that story. This is um, in Leviticus chapter 10. This, these are the sons of, uh, of Aaron and what they did. They die there. And then they depart from Sinai um, uh, after about a year or so, the 11 months, five days, they depart from Sinai and they start moving. Now, uh, we, we just started to go through this last week, and so I'll, I'll let you pick up right here and we'll get into a little bit more depth here. What I wanted you to see is now they, they begin to move north. Looking on your map, you see the wilderness of Sinai there. You notice how the, the red line kind of goes up and then moves west to the left a little bit to a place called Ezion Gebir. So in Deuteronomy chapter 1, maybe that's... Um, Maybe that's where I'll have you go. Actually, go to Numbers 33. It's probably a better place. Go to Numbers chapter 33. And then we'll drop down to verse number 36. Okay? Now, if you recall last week, I told you I think there's 50 stops along the Exodus route. We're not going to go through all 50 of them. Um, God lists them all out here in Numbers, but he doesn't tell you everything that happens in every stop. But this took a fair bit of time. Um, now keep in mind, I mean, they're not, they're not driving cars, they're walking and there's old people and there's little kids and they, they're moving at a very slow pace and they've got, they've got a lot that they're carrying with them. So they're, they're just steadily moving along. Uh, so what could take a normal adult that's unencumbered could take them, you know, X period of time. It takes the nation a whole lot longer to get there. All right. So I want you to notice numbers 33 and verse 36, they removed from Messiah and Gebir and they pitched in the wilderness of Zin, which is Kadesh, right? 
<coughs> pardon me, the verse before that tells you that they actually arrive in Zion Geber. Now, um, in Deuteronomy chapter number one, I, I do want you to look at that now as well. So that's just a few pages over, by the way. Look at Deuteronomy chapter one, just to give you some context for where we're at in the scriptures and then in the, uh, in the, the map itself. Deuteronomy one in verse number two. Just this statement in parentheses that actually has a great value. There are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. Now that may not mean a single thing to you, but look at your map while I read that. Horeb, does anybody know what Horeb is? There's another word for it. What's the other word? Sinai. So Horeb and Sinai are the same. Everybody with me? So Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai is the same mountain. So this says that there are 11 days journey from, from Horeb in verse 2 by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. Now they're on their way to Kadesh Barnea. If you notice on the Exodus route here, you notice the very top dot that you have here, it says Kadesh. Okay, that's Kadesh Barnea, same place. So it says that there's 11 days journey from from Horeb, which is Sinai, up to Kadesh. So when you look on your map, God says it takes 11 days to walk that road, to walk that route. There's no road. 11 days, okay? So it's important that you understand that because if it takes 11 days to get from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, then if you look up here for just a minute, this, this area that, that's currently called the Sinai Peninsula, Mount Sinai can't be here. Because it's a lot further than 11 days to get from Mount Sinai, if it's here, all the way up and over to Kadesh Barnea. But God told you in, Deut told you in Deuteronomy chapter 1, it's just 11 days walk. Okay? And that, that shows you again, this is where Sinai was on this side. Okay, so we're, I'm trying to give you a picture of where this took place. So now they end up in Kadesh. Uh, so again, that just shows you this is in the nor northwest corner of, um, of Sinai, uh, Saudi Arabia. So they stop along the way, um, it, you know, even though it's an 11-day journey, they actually stop more than this along the way. Uh, but if they just walk continuously, it, it would be 11 days. So they go northward from Sinai to the tip of the Red Sea. If you're looking on your map there, this place called Isaiah Gabir. This is in Numbers 33, which we read a minute ago. And then they go northward up to Kadesh Barnea. So they're on their way to a particular place. Now, at, during this time, um, Aaron and Miriam, now who are these two? The sister and brother of Moses, right? And it's during this time that God tells you in Numbers chapter 12 that um, Aaron and Miriam, they speak against Moses marrying an Ethiopian woman. Okay, racism runs long and deep in the world. So they, they're murmuring about the fact that Moses married, married this woman. Numbers 12, I'll read it to you. It says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he'd married an Ethiopian woman. So for whatever reason, God doesn't tell you why they didn't like it. I mean, I might just make a tongue-in-cheek comment about racism. It had nothing to do with that. But whatever the cause was, they spake against it, and God wasn't happy about that. And as a matter of fact, he judged Miriam. Do you remember what he did? He gave her leprosy for a period of time and just brought shame on her publicly and said, now, okay. So th th what that shows you then is that she was, she was the voice and the instigator behind it. It wasn't... It wasn't Aaron that was the instigator. He just followed it. But the Lord put a, a judgment on her for that. But anyway, that takes place. If you're familiar with that story, all of that takes place as they're moving northward uh, on their way up to Kadesh Barnea. So they, they stop in the wilderness of Paran, uh, and this is for the sending of the, of the 12 spies. Remember I told you that we were going to do the, the 12 men went to Canaan. How's that go again? 12 men went to spy on Canaan? Is that what it is? Come on, you know this song. You're afraid I'm going to ask you to come up here and sing it. Uh, ten were bad and two were good. I, I said I was going to have the deacons do that. Didn't I say that? Yeah. So um, might be a good idea. But um, this is the sending of the spies. So we've all heard the story right, of, about the spies and uh, heading off into uh, spy out the promised land. So they stop in this wilderness of, of Paran. Now, if you're looking at Kadesh on your map, uh, the, the wilderness of Paran is just, just off to the west of that and just a little bit south. So they kind of stop in that area. It's very, very close to that, but they just stop in that area. 
and um, because Kadesh is kind of in the mountains and the wilderness of Paran is down below it. It's like what you see at the bottom. The wilderness of Sinai is the, the wilderness valley that leads up to the mountain of Sinai. Okay, so they're, they're right below Kadesh, and that's the place that they stop. And God says, all right, time out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you send the spies in, and they're, they're going to spy out the land. So this takes place, and we can go to that next, um, that next slide that has the sort of the little dotted line on it. Uh, this is talking about Kadesh. Now, the one before that, please. Um, just go down to Kadesh. If we go. That's, that's the one. Okay. Um, so they, they go to, um, to Kadesh now. And uh, are you in, in Deuteronomy chapter number one still? Um, look down at verse number, verse number 19. Notice God says this, and when we departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness, which you saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. So you can picture the, the type of a place that they're going. It's this great and terrible wilderness that they're, they're passing through uh, as they travel. So they stop here in this wilderness of Paran, and then, um, and then they send out the spies. Now, remember I told you that there's just 11 days journey if you were to, to walk it. But you know how long it took them to get there? 11 months. It wasn't because there was anything wrong. It's just that, that they had stops along the way. God was making them stop, okay? So this is now two years. It's 24 months after they've left Egypt, and it's the first month of the third year, okay? So the Passover and their departure, we're talking about the, the first month of the first year, and they depart. This is now the first month um, of the third year now, and so they've been two years uh, on the road. Numbers chapter 12 and verse number, verse number 16, it says that the people removed from Hezeroth and they pitched in the wilderness of, of Paran. And uh, then the Lord said to Moses, you send those men out to search out the land of Canaan. So let me tell you a little bit about this, this time where the, where the 12 spies go northward. Now you can go ahead and go to that next uh, picture if you will. Okay, so this is just a, just a very little way of showing you at the bottom of the red line on your map there, you see that is where Kadesh is, Kadesh Barnea. That's where the wilderness of Paran is. This is where the Israelites have stopped and the spies go out. And for 40 days, these men spy out the land. Okay, it takes them 40 days to go. And so they go through Beersheba. Um, they go through Hebron uh, in the south of Dan there. They go up to Damascus. They go 240 kilometers north. That's a long way to travel. Okay, and these guys are on foot. So this is the roughly the route. I mean, we don't know exactly, but I mean, the, the line tells you that this is where they were and this is where they ended up at the top of the, the northern borders of what God gave to Israel. And, uh, and then it says that they returned. And in Numbers chapter 13, here's what God says about it. He says, and they returned from the searching of the land after 40 days. And so they come back after 40 days. Now, now you know the story, right? What did they see there? <coughs> yeah, it's all the giants. You know, the funny thing is, that's where, that's where we... That's where we go to in our mind when, I, when we say, well, what did they see? It's true, but that's not the only thing they saw. Actually, they saw the blessing before they talked about the problem. This is a fruitful land. You know what they said? They, they said, this is everything God said it was going to be. It flows with milk and honey. It's got the blessings of God. You can't believe how fruitful this land is. It's amazing, but... Now, if we were going to just stop right here and I was to preach about this, you know where we'd go with it, right? How like, how like this we are. We look at the promises of God, and just like Hebrews says, they could not enter in because of unbelief, right? And that's the way we are. So that's what happened. The spies come back, and uh, they give this report. So I want you to look at Numbers chapter 14. Now, remember what I said to you last week. Uh, in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers... And then Deuteronomy, these are not chronology. Some of it is chronological, but some of it is just historical and a reiteration of certain things that have taken place. So you can't read it as chronology unless it's clearly chronological. Um, Numbers chapter number 14. Here we go. Let me find it in my Bible. The congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. What a wailing that must have been. Now, why did they wail? Because the, verse, the two verses or three verses before that, at the end of chapter 13, do you see that in your Bible? Um, verse 32, they brought an evil report of the land which they had 
searched out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it were men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came down, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Surely they were looking at us the way we were looking at them. And all the people lifted up their voice and they wailed and they cried. And so notice verse 2 of the next chapter. They murmured against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, would God that we died in the land of Egypt. Or would God we died in this wilderness. And wherefore, that means why in the world has the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? Notice verse 4. And they said, one to another, let's make us a captain, return into Egypt. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to replace Moses. We're going to overthrow Moses. We're going to find somebody else, and he's going to march us back to Goshen. Now, you think God is happy about that? Well, we know he's absolutely not happy about that. So they want to replace Moses as the leader, and God says, let me tell you what's not going to happen. So drop down to, to verse number 23 of the same chapter. Sorry, verse 22. God says this, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, God keeps track. Keep that in mind. God keeps track. They've tempted me ten times in the wilderness. He says, they have not hearkened to my voice. What does that mean? They won't listen to what I had to say. Notice in the next verse. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear to their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it, except for, he says, Caleb, and then, of course, we know Joshua. What does God say? Look at verse 29, same chapter. Would you look down? Now, this is pretty severe. Look at it. Your carcasses shall fall in the, this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, God said, you're all going to die here. Now, what he didn't do, God didn't just kill everybody. What he said is, you're going to get the fruit of your rebellion. Okay? You wanted to go back into Egypt? You thought it was best to walk back through the wilderness? I'm going to let you circle the wilderness until you all die. You're not going to get the land because you, you disbelieved, you wouldn't hearken, you've been tempting me. Okay? This just is just rebellion. That's why I titled this whole thing The Wandering Rebels. That's exactly what God sees here. So God is angry with the nation. He passes judgment upon the adults 20 years old and up. Okay? God is talking about an age of accountability here. From 20 years old and up, you're accountable. He says, you're going you're gonna to fall in this wilderness. And so that's exactly what happened. So the people say, okay, listen, no, we're sorry. That not that human nature? Oh, sorry, God, you know. And uh, God says, too late. I've already passed it. So the people decide they're going to do something else. You're in chapter number 14. Look down at verse number 40. Uh, it says, they rose up early in the morning, and they got them up into the top of the mountain. So they went up to the top of the mountain. They said, lo, we be here. Now we're going to go into the place which the Lord's promised. We've sinned. Oh, we're so sorry. Now, you know what? They weren't sorry about their, their sin. They were sorry because God pronounced judgment on them. And now they're like, time out, Lord, you know, you know, do over. He didn't mean it, just joking. So there was no repentance. That's the issue. They were just sorry they got caught, and there's judgment. That's the, so it's a story for another time. So Moses said in verse 41, wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? Now he says, you're stepping over another line. Why are you doing this? It shall not prosper. He said, go not up, for the Lord is not among you that you be not smitten before your enemies. Okay, you know what the people are going to do? They said, no, no, we're going to go in and we're going to fight the enemy now. No, I'm sorry, you know, we've sinned, we've done the wrong thing. Okay, everybody, get your swords. Yeah, we're going to go up uh, and we're going to go ahead and fight and, and take possession of our land. And Moses says, what are you doing? God said, no. God said, you're going to die. You don't get the land. If you go up, you're not going to prosper. You're going to fall before your enemies. That's what he's trying to tell them. And then notice verse 43, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. They're waiting for you, and ye shall fall by the sword. Guys, you're going to die because you're turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. You need God's presence to fight this battle. You don't have it. Moses cares about the people. Don't go. Notice it says, verse 44, they presumed to go up to the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. And the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in the hill and smote them. And discomfited them. That's God's way of saying, kill them. 
as they fled all the way to Horma. They took off running, and the, the enemy beat them down. Okay, So they decide they're going to go fight the Amorites, and then many of them were killed. Now, I want you to flick over with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 1. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 1, not far away. And Moses rehearses this many years later to the new nation. But I want you to see in verse number 43 what Moses says. I was speaking to, I think, Brother Earhart, I think you and I were talking about this a week or so ago, this word. But I want you to notice verse 43. Moses rehearses this years later. Look at it, would you? He says, we're in Deuteronomy 1, verse 43. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and ye went presumptuously up into the hill. You know, to presume upon God. Here's what that means. No, God's going to take care of me. Now, God's not going to do anything bad. God loves me. God's going to forgive me. It's all good. God's okay. God's too loving to do this. They presumed against God, and they went up, and they died, right? So it's not God's fault. God said, don't go, you bunch of rebels, and they went anyway. So all of this takes place at Kadesh. Now, uh, I, I want to go to the next um, uh, to the next thing. Actually, if you'll look at that, sorry, go, go the one... Prior to that with the map again, if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind. Yeah, do you notice there's a couple things I wrote down here that I, I just wanted to make mention of. When the spies went up, uh, they, they went north, but notice they went through Hebron. God already told you in Genesis that Hebron was where Abraham was buried, right? His burying place. So they would have gone right through there. Uh, the, the history that we've already learned about through the book of Genesis, they went through this, this land already. And some of the some of the places like Beersheba and others, there's, there's a lot of significance to those places, and God brings those out in here where the spies went up and, and saw all this, all right? And then, of course, when they came back, they came by the brook Eshkol, remember, and they took these grapes, and it was so much that they had to, two guys had to carry this massive thing of grapes, and um, so anyway, they brought that back, uh, the spies brought that back. Okay, so now I, I want you to, to jump forward then, and to the next slide here, the next picture, um, the I just said here that their carcasses fall in Kadesh, because that's what God said. Your bodies are going to die here, okay? Now, <clears throat> can I just say something? I, I know if you don't have context for the Bible, this makes God sound so severe and harsh. But I just want you to understand that, that, that that's not actually the character of God, okay? God, God is a God of love, but God is a God of justice. And both of those things have to be true. You can't have one without truly having the other. So he's, he's loving enough that he says, please do this because this is for your betterment. But if you don't, the consequence is this, right? So I love you enough to give you a good way, but I also love you enough to tell you there will be judgment. Okay, that's the nature of God. So our, 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 weak, our weak world today spiritually, uh, does not believe in the judgment of God. They only believe in the love of God. And they paint a very false picture of who God really is. But any, any parent, it is presumptuous, but any parent has both of those attributes if they're a good parent. There's great love for their child, but there's also a love enough to bring punishment for wrongdoing. Why do we do that? Because we love our child, Right? We want to correct their behavior. So that's God. So this, this is not God being a moral monster. This is God lovingly saying, I've given you a way, now walk in this way. Because if you don't, there's going to be a consequence for that. And then they rebelled against that, all right? So let's talk lastly here about what happens in Kadesh, all right? So um, I want you to look in Deuteronomy chapter 1 if you're there right now. And I just want you to notice what Moses said about the nation. It's important you see the last verse of Deuteronomy chapter 1. Verse 46 says this. So ye abode in Kadesh, it says, many days, according unto the days that ye abode there. So in other words, you, you guys were there for a really long time, okay? Now, God tells you how long they were there. You know how long they were there? 38 years. The many days is 38 years of of their time there. Remember, God said, you can't go north. North was the promised land. You can't go. You have forfeited that right. You can't go north. So they spend 38 continuous years in the, the wilderness of, of Kadesh. Now, I mentioned, I believe, last week, and I wanted to just show you this by way of picture. Kadesh is Petra. 
How many of you know where Petra is? Or you've heard of Petra. It's in Jordan today, right? But you know that, right? Everybody's heard of Petra. Have you seen the city? Surely you've seen Indiana Jones, right? Don't tell me you haven't seen it, right? So you know Petra. So that's, that's Petra. But I want you to keep something in mind here. The, the ancient ruins that we see of Petra today did not exist at the time that Israel was in the area that we know to be Petra. These were the Nabataeans that carved this into the rock of Petra in, the, in about 350 B.C. But the Israelites here were in this area in the 1490 B.C., a long time before the Nabataeans were there. So you can go there today and you can see the area that they've carved into the rock. That is the area where Israel was, but it didn't look like that at the time. Okay, We're talking about 1,100 years later that the Nabataeans did that. So just as long as you understand... I, I put that in there so you have context for where this was. But don't you find this, uh, how many of you knew that this was Petra? Did you know that Israel was there? Yeah, I, I didn't know that. But when, when you study that, then you realize, oh, wow, this is, that's where this is. Now, again, do you remember when we talked about the ten plagues? I, I wish we had more time. Do you, you remember when I was telling you about the ten plagues? And I was telling you that there's a parallel between these ten plagues and the plagues of the tribulation. Do you remember that? Okay, now if we had the time, and maybe we'll take it at some point, I'll run the parallels through, and you'll see that they're not, all, not identical, but very close to identical plagues. Okay, but what you have is you have a recreation of things that God is going to bring into this world. Uh, have you heard that expression, history repeats itself? That's absolutely true. So there's so much of what God did in the Exodus and the events of Israel and Egypt and their, their escape from Egypt that God is going to recreate again during the tribulation including this place called Petra. So Israel is here for this period of time, and uh, this is where they wander for a little bit. I just find it interesting. God's going to bring them right back here, by the way, during the tribulation. All right. So in Numbers chapter 14, don't turn back, but let me just tell you. Do you remember what we just looked at in Numbers 14? Um, the people rebel. They go up to the mountain. They're going to fight, and then they're overcome, right? Before they go up to fight, they had just finished complaining about the fact that, you know, the, there's giants in the land. And here's what God said. Okay, you're all going to die. But then God said this. I'm going to read the verse. He says, tomorrow, turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Okay, so would you look back on that map? They're in Kadesh, which is Petra. They've rebelled against God. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, they've rebelled against the Lord. And the Lord says, okay, tomorrow, turn around, go back into the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Okay, you know where God was sending them? God wanted them to go back to his Zion Gebir, that area. He says, you go back. But there's no record in the Bible that they obeyed. There's no record that they actually went back there right there. What they did is they wandered around in the wilderness here uh, of, of Kadesh. God says, go back. Now, it was, it was soon after this particular time. Are you familiar with the story of Korah? I, I may actually delve into this story in the coming weeks. But Korah rises up with 250 men, and he tries to overthrow uh, Moses and, in, and insert themselves into the priesthood. Okay, now guys, you know that, that the priesthood was the Le Levitical line, correct? And so God chose the, the tribe of Levi to stand before him. Isn't that right? And so they, they didn't get the same kind of land inheritance that the other tribes got. This was their, God said, I'm your inheritance. So it was something completely different. So it, this family group, we call it a tribe, but this is a family group of Levi. The sons of this family group were cho chosen by God to be the priests. And um, only this group, like only these men. But Korah rose up with 250 men and presumed again to insert himself into the priesthood. And so God does this, this thing with him. And um, I want you to look at Numbers 16 because you just, you have to see this if you haven't seen it before. Numbers 16. <clears throat> now, okay, all of this happens after they have rebelled. The spies have given an evil report. By the way, God killed those 10 men. Did you know that? God, those 10 men that came back and says, we can't, God killed them. Moses and Moses, or sorry, um, Caleb and Joshua said, we can. And God said, yes, and you will. But the 10 that said, no, God killed them. So now this is right after that, okay? Then Korah rises up. Numbers chapter number 16, and uh, uh, we'll go down to verse 19. Korah gathered all the congregation against them, talking Moses and Aaron, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and then the glory of the Lord appeared to the congregation. And so this is, this is Korah saying, hey, I'm, I'm, 
I'm inserting myself into the priesthood. So notice what God does. Moses says, hey, you're not going to prosper here. You're going you're to get judged. So Moses says in verse 29, look at that chapter. He said, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hasn't sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick or alive, like living into the pit, he says, then you'll understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Okay, I find this fascinating. And so verse 31, it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. You can't make that up. Imagine seeing that. So Moses said, okay, I'm going to show you that God sent me. So if these guys just drop dead because their heart failed, God didn't send me. But if God does something he's never done before, you're going to see. And so he said, if the, if the earth opens up and these guys die, you'll see it. And man, as soon as he got done speaking, God just split the earth. Can you imagine that? Whoosh. Everybody goes. So imagine what the people must have thought. Um, but they saw the power of God, and of course they, they had a healthy respect of leadership at that point, I think. Uh, so this takes place uh, where, where Korah and the 250. Now, the very next day, God tells you it's the very next day that the people rose up. After that, the next day, the nation rises up and they complain about what happened yesterday. So they know that Korah and the 250 guys were trying to insert themselves into the priesthood. They knew that was wrong. They watched them die. And then the very next day, the people rise up and complain about the death of Korah. And God sends a plague that kills two, uh, sorry, uh, 14,700 of them that were complaining. Now, I want to I give you a picture of something. Archaeology today is the attempt to understand yesterday's history. We dig in the ground and pull things up and try to decipher it. Okay. What you need to understand about Kadesh Petra is, is it was a gigantic graveyard. Because in this very small area around Petra for 38 years, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 million people. And then what, whoever was under 20 is not included in that number. But you're talking about a, a million and a half, 2 million people probably that died in that area. It's an enormous graveyard. It was not the purpose or will of God that this took place. But the rebellion of these people, God says, you're not going in. That's, that's Petra. That's Kadesh. Now, the, the flip side of that is that this actually becomes a place that God uses to preserve his people in the tribulation. But at this time, there's judgment, okay? So this, uh, the, this bunch of people dies. Okay, um, in Numbers chapter 20, you don't even have to turn over there. Um, uh, Miriam dies at this point uh, as they're, uh, on this part of their journey. Okay, this is, the, this is the place, by the way, where Moses got mad at the nation and he hit the rock again. You guys familiar with that story? So we go back to the, to the typology, right? People ask, well, why in the world didn't God let Moses into the promised land? Well, here's why. Um, the people rebel again. We're in Numbers 20, if you want to look at it. They rebel again. They murmur again. And we don't have any water. And Moses, you're lousy. And God hates us. And we want to go back to Egypt. And we're, we're thirsty. And so Moses said this. He said, shall I fetch water out of the rock, you rebels? And that was the problem. Moses had a temper problem. I can sympathize. Um, yeah. And... Right, he should have spoken it. But notice what Moses, if you recall what Moses said there, he said, shall I fetch water out of the rock? That was his first problem. This wasn't, this wasn't Moses' fight, this was God's. And Moses took upon himself, and, and God honored the authority, and God was going to give grace to the people because they needed, they needed the water. And Moses hit the rock again, and God said, you're done. Now, you know why? Because Moses broke the type. What's the type? Christ was smitten once. He was smitten once, and the living water comes out from one sacrifice forever, once. Okay, now, now let me just say something to you. For those of you that are ex-Roman Catholics, as you know, the Mass is a celebration of the unbloody sacrifice, the re-sacrificing of Jesus every time they partake. That's what the Mass is. 
it's a blasphemy of the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ every time it takes place, okay? So God is saying here to Moses, no, you should have just spoken. The rock only gets hit once. And so when that happened, God said, you don't go. Now, you'll, I'll let you look at it, but you'll not go over, okay? You, and he said, you didn't honor me, okay? Moses broke the type. So that's the, that's the point. Moses gets angry. He strikes the rock, and he forfeits his right um, to get into the promised land. Okay, are we okay? I'm, I'm almost done with this, but let me just finish this off. Here's what this shows you. This also shows you uh, that there was no natural water source in the land. God had to continually supernaturally provide water. There was no, there was no uh, oasis that the people were going to, okay? I've read a number of guys that were talking about this particular, and I don't believe them, because they're talking about, oh, they, they wandered around this great big oasis in, around somewhere around Kadesh. There was no oasis. God was supernaturally providing water for his people. This is a great and terrible wilderness. They already said that, okay? So God is, is continuing to, to do this. So from the time of the rebellion, uh, the 10 spies, uh, there's 38 years until the nation is now finally purged. So we're almost done here, but go to Deuteronomy chapter number uh, 2, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 2. We're just kind of flicking back and forth between these two books. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2. Look at verse number 14. Moses says this, And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zered was thirty and eight years, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host as the Lord sware unto them. So this Kadesh near Petra here, this graveyard, is this place where all of these people died, and it was a total of 40 years, all right? God reckoned the time from, from Egypt until here. Total of 40, year, 40 years, but the 38 years were right here in this particular time uh, of Kadesh. Um, so after this time, and we'll get into this now as, as uh, in a further study and look, but this is when they go back to Isaiah Geber, down south to the tip of the Red Sea, and then they begin their northward journey up uh, on, on sort of the right side of the Dead Sea, which we'll look at later, um, and they go around Edom and Moab, and they head, head on up to uh, where they cross over into the Promised Land and where Jericho is, okay? So we're going to look at that later. So this is, this is 40 years of, of wandering, uh, and this puts you at about 1,451 as far as time frame when uh, they enter into Canaan. Remember, it was 1491 when they left Egypt, and then you have the 40 years of wandering. brings you to 1,451, and then they enter into the land of Canaan. And then we'll, when we get to that, we're, we'll talk about Jericho and uh, the whole story behind Jericho and the crossing of the, of the Jordan River. All right, so that takes us through the, the root of the Exodus. There is so much more about the Exodus I didn't cover, so very much in the Bible about it. But, uh, you know, for purposes of this, we don't really have time to go into that. But I'd encourage you to, to just read and study through that if it's of interest to you. You'll, I think it'd be a blessing. All right, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to have... Um, we're going to do something real quick before we dismiss. Our Father, thank you for your word today. Um, it's been a good day uh, together. Thank you for your faithfulness to us as we've, as, as we've listened, as we've learned. And I pray that there'd be some fruit in our life this week. Uh, because.